Okay, good afternoon. We're going to start this session of the London Financial Regulation Seminar. This week we are meeting twice. We have a session on Monday on Credit Suisse and we have a session today on an equally exciting but different topic, which is using artificial intelligence to compare regulations, particularly in my field, financial regulations. And I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Giovanni Bandi, who is the executive director of the Regulatory Genome Project in Cambridge, to discuss this very important theme in which we are learning and constantly hearing about new developments on a daily basis, not necessarily on the Regulatory Genome Projects, but the application of artificial intelligence to many other areas, generative artificial intelligence, whether it's chat GPT or many other very contemporary and sometimes I should say controversial developments on how it is going to impact the future of our society. Um, Dr. Giovanni Vandi, he uh, did first uh, degree a BSc and SE in banking and finance in Bocconi. He was also visiting a scholar on securities regulation in Georgetown University, and then he completed his PhD in banking, corporate and finance and securities law at Durham University, and I was um, one of the examiners of his PhD. So I'm delighted that we have managed to stay in touch with the time since he became a doctor and that he is back in the UK for a while. He was in Qatar, where he was both with the Qatar um, Financial Authority as well as being a junk professor at the Northwestern University in Qatar, but he's back in the UK. And, and just uh, as you can see, those of you who signed for the seminar today, the Cambridge University's Regulatory Genome Project is a... Um, a, 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 a project which, whose aim is to develop and support of artificial intelligence enable information structure that can standardize how digital application review and catalog digital information on financial regulation. It is a public open information structure and the mission is based on the belief that such a shared information structure, open access will give regulators and policymakers better tools with which to publish, analyze, and supervise the regulatory framework. And um, I will not say any more other than that, it has currently a partnership with IOSCO to build MASI, which is a pilot front end to um, support analysis of obligations and gaps in the IOSCO, the International Organization, Securities Commission's principles and standards. But if I continue to talk, I will get more into the project. And the idea today is to hear from Dr. Giovanni Vandi about the, the implications, what he's doing, and um, any further developments that you know, we may want to discuss today. I know that we talked about applications when he and I were talking about how and on what he should discuss today. We talk about the applications for many other international financial institutions, but we may want to leave that for the Q&A. So uh, I will mute myself for a better quality of the recording. And, and thank you very much, uh, Giovanni, for being with us today and also for on such a relatively short notice changing the date of your presentation since I was very keen to chair this event. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Lastra. It's uh, it's my pleasure to to be here and and to be part of this uh, today. The discussion we had uh, it seems to be uh, there's a lot of questions that which are constantly raised on on this topic. Uh, for today, I thought about explaining what we're doing in Cambridge and uh, how is that fitting what we think is going to happen next. How is it aff effectively affecting the, the the world of law and regulation? Um, and uh, at a personal note, it, it's, it's nice to, to see you again and not uh, to confront you at the, <laughs> at the panel for the PhD. So it was a fair and but tough 
<laughs> experience, personal experience that I still have uh, memories of, but uh, it, it was good. All right, so the, the regulatory genome project, it, it's a, quite a unique name for, for a research project which doesn't sit uh, with the, with science department. It is actually sitting with a business school with uh, injuries, if you will, from, from the law department and the and the computer science department here in Cambridge, but it actually sits with the business school and there's a specific reason for it. The ultimate goal of the uh, uh, regulatory genome project is to create that scheme that can be used for financial services uh, stakeholders, both regulators and industry to understand each other when they are using artificial intelligence or a scheme via a scheme uh, to, to talk to each other. And in summary, that what, what it is, uh, Professor Lastra uh, mentioned that it is an information structure and information structures are necessary for um, uh, machines being uh, operationally able to uh, understand the, what is the way we restructure a specific type of thinking, if you will, uh, that has to be embedded in the process of understanding which rules we are talking about. So the regular genome project at this stage is, is, is uh, strictly speaking in relation to financial services regs. It follows a specific methodology. We'll talk about that. Uh, but the, in principle, the, the genome project can be extended. It doesn't have to be about financial services law specifically. Uh, but the methodology allows to then um, uh, being applied elsewhere. So I would start with uh, a very simple way of trying to describe what the, what the uh, regulatory genome project is. The regular genome project was uh, basically was born a few years ago, uh, unsurprisingly, with somebody from industry wrote a check to, to the university for research as from time to time, academics receive uh, and, and, and they take advantage of. Uh, and this company had one very specific problem. They had, uh, they were a FinTech, they were expanding, but they didn't understand what rules apply to them beyond the UK borders. And in, in, that was a very simple issue, which uh, usually solved with contacting a variety of uh, uh, professionals in every single country you want to operate on and, and probably getting a very expensive way of, of, of doing that, which uh, can serve as, uh, as a stopper for a startup. So the, this company actually asked, is there a way that we can just identify the rules and read it ourselves? Uh, but how do you compare the rules? And, and so the regular genome project was born. Uh, the, region, the, the regular genome project effectively starts with uh, harvesting the information uh, that uh, you would be required for once to do comparative analysis. And perhaps this is before I proceed, I should stop a, a, a moment there and explain it a bit further. The, the genome in itself is, is a high level information structure so that you can compare rules across different countries because certain things do not apply, certain obligatory obligations and certain uh, articles, certain restrictions uh, do not apply uh, uh, in, 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 at the national level as they can be applied elsewhere. And so um, the, the, the genome effectively tried to solve that issue. And so as it said, we can build something for you, but this, this thing is going to be in families of obligations. So it's a top-down type of approach to try to understand what are the, the, the rules that would apply specifically for the company of FinTech to go across the UK, from the UK uh, across the world to the same business. So the genome, uh, re, the, the pipeline, if I can use the term, which is a, a more of a computer science term, really is the, the, the com a combination of various steps and the genome focuses on what is central, which is the taxonomy. Well, we'll explain it as we go ahead. If you have to do what I just said, you want to compare different rules. The first thing, you will probably need to collect the information. And even that is, is not something very easy. There is very little unique repository of, of laws and, and, and uh, regulations, in, even for financial services, something as developed as financial services. And so one of the things that uh, was first enabled by the university and, was this um, collection of machine, um, through machines. So uh, crawlers, which are specifically built to extra identify a publisher and extra all the information 
and, and retain it from all around the world. And uh, the, the genome, the, the company that participates in the genome process right now, uh, the, uh, we have surpassed over 100 countries and uh, we, we harvest in, in three different languages. Uh, now, within a country, we also collect information from virus publisher. I mean, an, an example, if, if you have a FISMAS publisher, the, the level of the um, um, parliament, but then, you know, the regulations are the FCA or the Bank of England PRA. So once we create a, a unique um, a digital uh, uh, format of those, uh, all of those uh, regulations, we then have the, this database, and the database is actually pretty homogeneous. You know, the, the things already started to, to look alike in terms of the way they are organized. However, we also have digital format of things which are not digitally native. And you can think about, we, we sometimes need to extract information from PDF formats, for example, which are not in the same, they're not structured the same way. The title is not in the same position. You can think when you read an EU uh, piece of regulation, it always starts the same. Uh, at, at the very top, uh, it says this is a directive, this is a regulation, this is the name of the regulation, it applies this, and it, it, it is in relation to something. That is not always the case. So the machine has to be trained to recognize that information and try to set, set in order. That is the second step. At that point, the hard part becomes uh, the one that we need to implement is, is the actually reading through the documentation. Now, they, here you have to train the machine to, to do what humans are trying to do, which is to recognize a, a, that the, a certain specific obligation is referring to a concept. And this is very important. The concept is, is, uh, is what initially uh, you need to train the machine on. And the concept in order is actually very uh, effective for machines to understand what is the, the structural thinking that you have behind it. So you can think of it as a binomial tree. I usually represent it as a binomial tree because this is how it works. A very simple example is AML. And if you have the concept of AML, an AML rule book gets identified by the machine. It, it, it is digested into this digital format database. And we have all the AML rules because we identify that uh, statistically speaking, the, the, the AML is discussed so many times that this must be an AML rule book. And then the machine has to read through it. Now, how do you dissect this, this, uh, this document in concepts that is effectively this uh, binomial represented there, which is a taxonomy? And that is actually what is the University of Cambridge regulatory genome. And what my team is doing is identifying the way that a machine can dissect a, a specific theme uh, uh, and, and feed that into to, to, to a, an AI together with a training set. A training set is very important because at that, that point you have the taxonomy, if, again, the binomial tree. And for each of the nodes, you're, you're supposed to provide some information so that the machine gets trained recognizing that. At that point, you have different documents. This, this document is read through. They've been highlighted with concepts which have been predetermined. And uh, going through a process in which also the scientists are happy about the output results and the experts read the results and then they give a thumb up or not, that, that type of process gets retained. And so at that point, you're able to create this uh, ability of, um, you have the ability to compare different obligations within the, the, the rules of different countries. Um, the characteristic of, of, the, of the Cambridge regulatory genome, we're talking about, again, an information structure, the one that I represented as a, um, uh, binomial tree. But what is very important is that uh, two, two pieces to it. One is that this is jurisdiction agnostic. And the jurisdiction agnostic is very relevant because you don't always have a the structure tends to be similar, but they're not always the same. And um, not just that, the, the moment that you feed information to the machine in order to train the machine, well, you need to also not to concentrate everything within the same type of publishers, right? So typically, there's a lot more information from the United States federal agencies or the European Union. 
much more than any other jurisdiction. So we have to be able to calibrate it in a, in a way that is not just related to that. And also the university has implemented a methodology to, to extrapolate from the beginning what the candidate taxonomy looks like. And I will discuss that. This is actually part of the PhD which I drafted and Professor Lastra asked me questions about that during my, my defense. And the other aspects of this is that uh, the university is building it as a public good. Basically, we the the the, the grant that was given for for this is that the schema becomes public to the extent that everybody can then make use of the same uh, information to to do that. Now, uh, from time to time, I, I use the uh, analogy to describe it, which is the Dewey Decimal System. I've I found that the Dewey Decimal System is well known to people who have, uh, you know. I would say above 30 and uh, not so much below 30. The reason is that if you go to a library, not just to sit and work on your laptop, but actually to get a book, uh, for those who have been there, uh, you will see that there's there are numbers. And, and these numbers are actually all uh, in relation to the Dewey Decimal System, which is a professor uh, in the 1800s uh, created, uh, Professor Dewey created a system for which uh, you have a generic scheme using number and decimal. Decimals have the characteristic that you can create a new decimal to slice a new type of uh, uh, topic which was not thought before. But the core is is the same. And so a number 500, that would probably be a, a, a natural science and mathematics across the world, independently of the country you go to. So the basic idea of creating the Cambridge Regular Genome as a public good is to actually have the type of structure so that possibly these uh, these tagging system uh, can be then adopted and, and, and be reused over and over by a publisher of regulations or consumers of regulations. Well, regarding the methodology, something very important is how do you come to understand where to start with uh, when you are working on a taxonomy? Well, their taxonomies are not um, that we think they're not just an extrapolation of what exists. There, there is a process of international policy making, and I'm sure Professor Lastra or, 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 or in Queen Mary that you will have courses for that, that at least teach the basics of that. They're not just created out of the blue. In fact, there are regulators all, 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 all over the world. They usually belong to a, a standard setting body, or at least they collaborate with a standard setting body or and observe the standards which are set in order to create a more harmonious way of producing policies. And they exist and they're usually they are sectorial. So the, when you say Basel, uh, Basel uh, in terms of banking rules, uh, it is actually the Bank of International Settlement in Basel. And they have a, a very specific core principles uh, which are being created in order to uh, guide what a, a solid, banking system looks like in terms of regulations to be adopted. Same ways for IOSCO when it comes down to securities. And the same is for IS insurance. And in, in the last 10, 15 years after the crisis, I think the FSB gained more of a role as a statistic body that's debatable. And of course, there's all everything else that is upcoming the, for ESG standards. So you can, there are a few ones, but the ISSB seems to be the one that will be the next. There are two which are related to Islamic finance and so far and so on. The Cambridge Regular Genome is being created on the back of those core principles. The basic idea is that the regulators are already sitting at this at, in here. They're already working together in committees to create what are supposed to be the principles of, of, of a good and solid uh, regulatory system. And providing that, it means that uh, Starting from there, it implies that you are embedding what is already the thinking, as well as creating a, a, a methodology to update this taxonomy as they progress. Having a new core principle or clarifying guidance about a new, a new principle or whatever it is, cre creates a system for then the Cambridge Regular Genome to be updated over time. One other important thing before I go ahead, and, and this is, I'm pretty sure, is dear to Professor Laster because he wrote, she wrote several uh, papers on that, is the function of the FSAPs uh, in, in this uh, international process. The FSAPs, for, for those who are not aware of it, they're basically the financial stability assessment program of the IMF. And 
the IMF, in order to establish, uh, they have a mandate. There's a team actually of 35 experts uh, sitting in, uh, in in Washington that basically are tasked with uh, verify that certain standards have been applied or they provide technical assistance to countries that will ask for it over time. And the, the main uh, tool that is used by uh, the IMF experts for carrying out an analysis of a um, regulatory system is actually the related uh, principles of the standard setting body. So there, there's a loop in there in which the country sitting the standard setting bodies, the regulators sitting the, the standard bodies, are the, the national level ones. Then they establish that as a secretariat type of organization. Then they try to implement them. And then the IMF checks that that is actually occur, at least for the, for the core one. Should that be evolving into something bigger and more constructed, I think, Again, we, we move into pure academia with Professor Lastra. I think she, she would say yes, with at least the last paper that I remember, uh, something that looks more of a world financial organization rather than uh, just a, a, a process. But uh, for the sake of this discussion, the Cambridge Regulatory Genome actually makes use of the principle because they are in effect the principle that everybody has to follow and there is a system for that. So, getting a little bit more in detail, uh, just to make sure to, to reiterate some of the points. If you take the first three sectorial, BIS, IOSC, and IS, which are, again, banking, securities markets, and, and insurance supervisors, we started the project. We are actually building specific taxonomies. As I said earlier, these taxonomies, they are thematic. The reason is that most of these rule books as issued by the central banks or, or security supervisor or insurance supervisors, uh, they are actually thematic. For example, the example, the, the example I gave earlier, AML. There's usually there is a, a FATF related. FATF would be the um, standard of the body in relation to AML. Actually, is uh, they have uh, an implementation document which specifically addresses certain targets and certain needs. Um, in the case of IOSCO, uh, the, the, we have a partnership for building a pilot for a, a machine that actually a front-end machine can be used by securities regulators to identify the, the red part of this, which is principle 24 to 28, which is which are all the investment management related uh, principles that are issued. And from there, basically means that uh, there's issues, um, there's requirements embedded into in in uh, in, in those uh, principles and uh, guidance which is provided. So, my team effectively analyzed how this is done, and we're going through the process of um, uh, enabling that. In fact, specifically for that, we have put together a, a a team of experts, which at a personal level, they are contributing, but they also come from places like the IMF, the World Bank, and other. Uh, experts worldwide on, on the topic. Uh, similarly, for the BIS, we're looking at the powers of the supervisors, and then the, specifically on insurance, we're looking at um, uh, the comframe, which is the one that um, would be the, uh, the the principles that uh, to assess for to assess that the in large insurance companies operating across the world, so those are operating cross border, are they're supposed to to have in place. Uh, in terms of uh, supervision and regulatory requirements. Now, I've entered this slide with the idea of providing a bit more insights what happens. I said earlier that the, we create this taxonomy, and the taxonomy effectively is, is a thematic one. This is a, a, a micro way to look at what happened inside the document. What we have in front of us, I think, is Article 4 of the um, uh, GD, uh, GDPR which is a very well uh, known piece of regulations on, on, the, on the data protection in, in, in Europe and for European citizens across the world. And uh, what it does really here, this highlighting part is the way that most, most output machines from or at least process uh, in the data science were already highlighted to you that way is identifying specific concepts which are embedded within the uh, the structure of the um, uh, of the article, so there's there's are there are certain things which also can be identified 
in terms of uh, not just the nature of the obligation. So basically saying this article, yes, is talking about uh, is an article that even a, a machine, statistically speaking, recognizes as being in relation to data protection and in relation to the use of personal and management of personal data. Okay, so that is what 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 it does. While it is a highlight certain obligation, but it also the machine able to identify if there are conditions and there are exceptions. So basically, there is the way that you would actually the complexity that can be born within a an article. And now these are some, some parts of these are uh, prototypes. Uh, they're not uh, fully functional. Uh, the genome in itself at this stage is able to understand what are the concepts and highlight to you by mean of statistics a, a specific uh, theme, for example, protection of data and, and exceptions. Okay, but uh, to do the full fledge, uh, we are not there yet. This is what happens inside a document. Okay, remember that the scope of the genome is to analyze data in bulk rather than, than in, uh, in a format of uh, a specific piece of regulation. So what we did, we actually developed something else which is more interesting, especially for the regulators community, which is the primary uh, partner to the regulatory genome project. And we built something of, a, it looks like this, effectively a, um, a regulatory heat map. Now here I have two different countries. I won't name them because I got in trouble in the past, uh, but there are two different countries on the left, country X and country Y. And it's pretty small, but this is how I would like you to read that. The first level actually describes uh, the, um, the generic uh, level one, what I call level one um, uh, parameters for, for the taxonomy. So in this case is ESG taxonomies. Uh, addressing um, both governance and sustainability and environment related ones. And uh, the first level, this is from a prototype which came out before the ISSB started issuing, uh, but they haven't ratified yet, but be, let's say this is one and a half years old and the world of ESG is actually is pretty old. But at least we divided that into the first level of blocks, so level one. And it reads the definition and parameters. So it's the, it's the white uh, boxes at the top, definitions and parameters, disclosures, ESG link, financial instruments, endorsement, risk management, emission trading, corporate ESG, and sustainable corporate governance. And this, this is the same for the two countries, of course. So the scheme is all the same. And vertically, you would have what we call a level two. So it's, it's a subset, a child, it is a technical term. Of of, uh, of the of the primary one, and so you would have more details. Now we use this heat map because automatically there are a few things which you can understand. We added on top of that the coloring. Now we highlight how many reference there are as a number there. Uh, the reference there are above obligations. You remember that what I showed you earlier a highlights of a concept which may be in relation to a specific topic. Here you got the, them to be counted. So we will know how many reference within the legislation of this country that are in relation to, let's say the first box, which I see, which is environmental liability. Okay, with the definition of what environmental liability is. However, you also have, if you also implement something else, which is a prototype or for, under, for training a machine to understand how strict the rule is. We call it an actionability score, meaning the a, a, a obligation, which is very strict and very hard, does not provide for uh, any uh, options or any exceptions. A one sentence in which you must do something will be probably very high scoring in terms of actionability score. While if you have a lot of optionalities and uh, there's, let's say, more, uh, less of a strictness, if you want to call it that way, of the obligation, then it is less. And the idea here is that we want to compare which one is the strictest one, and we can do it by theme. So, for example, if I look at the, the second column about the disclosures and notification, the third, the third down, which is the transparency requirement for operations and policies internal operations and policies. 
Well, that is actually in, in country X is very, very strong. The terminology used for what is, what, what is actually meant by transparency requirements uh, in, 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 in ESG is actually much stronger than country Y, despite the fact that they have more mentioning of the topic. So it's not just a question of how the machine can get trained to actually try to similar to the to the to to a human process to try to reflect if they mean what they're writing here is actually pretty strict or if it's not at all or somewhere in between uh, and so these type of tests actually they are coming up pretty well and they're very interesting because they they give you a story of the style of the regulator there's and we have identified the variety i didn't put in here but the most famous one is for our publications on the aml matters in which the United States and US were actually pretty much the same amount of obligations. So European Union law and, and the United States federal law they were pretty much the same when it came down to AML that simply have a different style. They had more about the buckets into uh, primary level one. Uh, the, the US were more focused on uh, reporting uh, uh, systems or to reporting obligations, while the European Union was more focused on the risk management side. Then the same type of analysis we're running for data protection. Turns out the European one is much more stricter than both in terms of uh, quality and, and, and number of obligations than the United States federal. It was actually not comparable at all. And that tells you effectively straight away what, what's happening in a country if you know how to read the, the, these, these maps. So I think that, so this is up to here, it's basically what the Cambridge Regular Genome has been doing and how we've been developing. I put another um, couple of slides and, and this is more for, for the, perhaps the, the, the questions that you may have and what is next. Well, my, my team we identified that actually the process of policy making, financial regulation, it is changing. And there is more and more demand for a version of these rules, which is digestible by machines. Now, the system is not very, very well built, though, because it starts with the, how the publication of these policies occur. And we found that most of the, the publication actually occurs at the level of, um, in, in a style which is a soft copy document, what do we call the soft copy document. You can think of it as a regulator publishing a PDF on their website and basically saying, this is my regulation X, Y, Z on, on this theme. So you just literally have to read the document in order to digest it. Um, and that is pretty much where most of the emerging markets and the developed markets are actually currently sitting. Evolution of that is what you can think of uh, being published in, in what we call an H what I call an HTML type of format, right? Which is a, on the digital publication or about on a website. And that is usually just text which gets written down by uh, the uh, the same text they would have inside a PDF or uh, maybe is well indexed uh, or is well organized. Basically it's just text on a, on a, on a page that you can read through and, and if you're lucky, you can copy paste for, for your own use. That is for the Bank of England that currently sits, Australia most, is mostly like that. But then there's already another way to do that, which is an, what is called an XML publication. Now, most EU, EU agencies, EU law, at a federal level, they actually uh, publish that way. And you can think of it as when you go and click, if you ever downloaded a EU directive, there's an HTML section somewhere. And there is a page, there's a channel in which you can download all of EU regulation all at once as it would be just one gigantic database. They don't do that out of the goodness of their heart. They actually do it because there is a real demand. And the demand is for the law to then be digested by a machine somewhere. Doesn't mean that there's an AI going to read through. It means that, that that is going to feed into a system or an archive system of sort in which the rules that can then be reused. And then ultimately, there's a new way of doing things. And the first case actually occurred uh, in uh, October last year uh, from uh, uh, FINRA, 
which is a self-regulatory body in the United States, which has been delegated the supervision of uh, brokers and broker dealers in, in the US. And the, what they build is very interesting. They basically realize that people want to look through the documents in a way that is understandable. You have to step back. The growth of um, uh, publications in the regulatory space, financial services regulations, is so, at the worldwide level, it's exponential. We're talking about that uh, the crawlers that we use, I think on a weekly basis, they discover maybe four or 500 new documents, uh, globally, of course, but there are a lot, and it can be guidance, it can be some sort of uh, anything that may be relevant. Uh, for somebody who is of the sector, but it is actually quite quite large in number. And so the need comes from understanding what are the rules without having to read the, the full rule book. All right. And 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 that is the, the there, there's, a, there's clearly a need for that. And the this FINRA, this agency, is actually the first one who has developed an API for it, has developed a, a publication uh, machine readable format. If you go to their website. They have tagged what are the, the top 50 rules that they really, really focus on. They know because their office receives every day the same questions from uh, firms, which are the, 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 the top questions that they got. So if you can think of it as a frequently asked question, but with a variety, with much more interconnectedness way of, of, of uh, describing that, is almost analyzing the body of rules but looking through only what is relevant to you or to your question. And that is the, the brand new version of doing it. It requires an API to be analyzed externally, or you, they actually have a website. You can actually go and select the taxonomy and all of that. And the, the structure, it's, this, this is very interesting because it is clear that both industry and regulators are thinking about what is next and what is how does the future look like, right? In, in the immediate, it looks like firms they can do with a bit of a more insightful way to look through the rules. And in order to to get there, you need to have at least a format in which these rules can be digested by machines. And it is no longer the, uh, simply applying that uh, or, or just writing the text on a, on a, a page. It is. It's gone beyond either you download it in bulk, but even better if you are actually looking for specific rules by theme and a machine can help you extract that information by theme. I think that's where it is going. And then I thought about a what we are looking for the future. This is also in relation to the executable machine executable format. So this is, let's say, is, is truly a jump I had. But this is what's happening now, and this is how we, we can look at it from a, a content to, to comply with specific rule. Well, right now, is natural language is the way that these things are written. We're talking about the text on a, on a page. Somebody thinks it through and provides that uh, as, a, as a mean of in, uh, uh, in whatever means they to choose from the simple soft copy to the most uh, sophisticated one with APIs. Uh, however, currently the process in order to be trans trans translated by a machine and, and then be digested by a machine goes through various steps. So first of all is, is the tagging and creating ontologies which makes sense. And there's most of these applications that are built in on machine learning modes, so machine identifying the obligations as we discussed earlier. NLP uh, applications, which in relation to, together with the deep learning of the machine combined in a pipeline, they basically free draft it or find the right information they're looking for. And from there, we actually have, uh, you know, it can be digested in the different formats, one with the workflow, one with the internal taxonomies, which are extra work and needs to be done from inside whoever is trying to work that out. So even if a regulator would say the left end of this is what the regulator can really help with and the, and the right hand is what the industry and, and others are really supposed to have. Now the, the future status, and, and this is, I take responsibility for this rather than the university, but here is what's next. And there have been cases, uh, particularly in uh, in Australia and in New Zealand of attempting to 
to see how to, well how you can translate a uh, natural language into a uh, uh, what they call an ambiguous regulatory language, which is really a code. And here we're talking about basically having an, an, an engine that represents the information really in a, in a yes or no type of form. If this is true, then this must be done. Uh, if I have to, to do uh, AML, KYC, CDD reporting, which is the order that you will find usually in this uh, AML rulebook, then it is true that you need to comply with this specific rule. And, and this requires enormous uh, investment in, 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 in data. Uh, it's called data lakes or repository for a variety of information. It also means that you are able to digest it and validate the data. But once you do that, you actually move into a new world. And the new world looks like that the, the, there is uh, going to be embedded supervision. So the ability for, uh, based on the, on the way that a certain law uh, or regulation has been uh, drafted, to actually have a, a supervision which is embedded in the process. And I can conclude just saying um, you can think of it uh, as a, a a blockchain and now blockchain has been in the last few years everybody has been discussing it and what is really blockchain blockchain is just that the dlt is a distribution ledger technology and and when it's well used uh, you can actually have way more information on every single transaction than simply having a um a, a, contra a contractual obligation and that being applied at a single level so my point is here is that it, it is the DLT is very hard to run uh, at scale. Uh, it is used for basic things like such as cryptocurrencies. Uh, the, the, the smart contract in it is very plain, uh, but it uh, one is set up. It really allows you to to know if uh, the, the the financial regulation has been uh, complied with uh, in a much more easier way than than not than the, the current version. So I think I'll stop here, and I think we yeah, have time to. We already have quite a few questions in the chat, but first I'm going to give the floor to Daniel, who is going to provide a, a brief discussion. Before I do so, I have um, just a question on 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 the numbers, and and the numbers that you use in the slide seven when you look the heat map comparison, you have been talking about the Dewey decimal system similarity, but can you just uh, um, just just for clarification before we get into the questions, um, just explain the, those numbers a bit more. Yeah, um, I can maybe go back to, to the slide. Seven. So this is the slides of reference, right? No, slide seven. Oh, sorry, seven, this one. That one, yeah. Okay, so... There's a distinction. So think of it this way. A, the GDPR, which is a slide after, it has, I don't remember how many articles, but it has a variety of text in it. Now, article and text and obligations embedded in, in, in there, they're a different number. An obligation is text which seems to be indicating that you need to, do you have a specific obligation to constructed going back to a very practical example, under AML rules, you, uh, financial institutions that need to have um, KYC processes, know your client processes, are part of this process they need to have, and they need to carry out what is called a CDD, a due diligence, a customer due diligence. That there is somewhere in the text of an AML rule book, there is first must have, must carry out compliance due diligence. That count as one even if in the same article, you may have multiple obligations. You have to carry out uh, customer due diligence and, and provide information on the uh, nature of the fund. It may be in the same article, but it counts as two obligations. The number you see there is actually the counting the obligations rather than the articles. Okay, so for instance, what... in sustainable investment will be the obligations 401, is that right? Correct. Okay. That is the number of obligations. Okay. okay. But the degree of being green or not 
that is a prototype of understanding how strict the obligation is. I'll be, is, think of it as a one to 10 in terms of uh, how ambiguous or unambiguous it can be. Yeah, yeah. You must provide an ID, it's, it's, it's a 10, it's definitely a dark green. Okay. Something as providing even uh, due digital skills, <laughs> that's very ambiguous. What are the right skills if they're not described? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that clarifies. So, sorry, it's just, just, just to make sure it's so fascinating. I don't want to take uh, time from the discussion. But Daniel, you have the discussion, and then we will have the first question by Eva. And there are other questions in the chat room. So, Daniel, the floor is yours for five minutes. No more uh, discussion, sorry. Absolutely, yes. I will keep short uh, for the sake of time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bandi, for this presentation. Very interesting. I think, um, from what I understood also from the presentation, uh, one important point to make is that uh, this uh, uh, Cambridge regulatory genome can have an impact on cost. So, in reality, can reduce cost uh, in terms of compliance for uh, regulatory companies, uh, but also in terms uh, uh, of reducing cost for regulators. So usually regulators are under budget. And, uh, and so always issuing new regulations and then needing the need, of course, uh, to enforce those regulations. And because they are under budget, uh, if we have uh, a sort of system where uh, essentially the majority of job is done uh, and uh, where enforcement in reality is simplified, uh, this can also reduce cost. And so this unsustainable model that today we have maybe in the future can look better. On the other end, uh, I think one point that was interesting was the last one uh, when uh, you were mentioning about the global solution. So the fact that because there are legal issues that are global complex, we need global solutions. And so for this reason, we need common standards, common regulatory standards. And this can also give in some way an efficient way to interpret those standards. So a common way of interpretation. And so we can say that the aims of the regulatory genome of Cambridge uh, in reality is based on two main aims. So one is to transform this human uh, readable regulatory text uh, into a machine readable form. And this is something that uh, we can identify as regulation as code and then regulation as content. So the global open standard that I was mentioning becomes the form of representation of regulatory concepts. So here, maybe even for discussion, in reality is the point, uh, if we think about regulation as code, we should rewrite regulation as code. This is hard, possibly, so it is an innovation bottleneck and also sometimes undesirable. So also another point can be, who has the final liability for poor outcome, for example. This is still, I think, unclear to me. And then uh, uh, on the other side, on regulation as content, if we think about regulation as content and so on this common standard, interoperability requires shared standards in some way and common ontologies, but how we can achieve this aim. And also regulatory risk in reality, if we think about that, uh, is something that uh, in my view cannot really be mit mitigated without regulatory endorsement. So th those are also some questions for you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Daniel, before you answer, let's just combine, compile the questions. I'm conscious of time. So Eva, eh, you, you wrote in the chat, but you may want to ask the question yourself. Yes, yes. So thank you very much for putting this on. I'm super interested in using AI for academic and other analysis. So this is a really great project. Um, I, I may start with reporting about a project that I was proud of um, that was called Barack and was about digital regulatory reporting. And uh, that was together with the UCL Blockchain Center. And we built a prototype for digital regulatory reporting. And the idea was indeed to find a way of using natural language regulations. And here I would like to pause and say, it's not natural language, it's legal language. That's different from natural language, which is then processed into machine readable format and then onward processed uh, into sort of a, a system where data is harvested from regulatory entities through a blockchain and shared with the regulator. 
what we found was the technology isn't very difficult. What is very difficult, however, are shared data standards. So the project was the digital regulatory reporting project with the FCA and has now become um, the transforming data collection project with the Bank of England. And that's a huge project where people just discuss what does it what 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 do different what what are different characterizations labels for data it's a data labeling project um so that's just as a point of information my questions to you however are am i right that the taxonomy is created by humans is that right correct yeah and then you use crawlers who bring in regulations. So that's an internet search. Correct. Uh, and then you bring on analysis, and that's a follow-up on uh, Rosa's question. So your search mechanism, does it find specific words, or is it able to identify places in regulation where a topic is covered without a specific word being used? Or in other words, how is this different from a search mechanism that Westlaw or LexisNexis would use? Mm -hmm. uh, and then just for the purposes of completion of just getting the questions, there was also one from Deborah. Deborah, do you want to ask yourself? No, but then, then just take those two and then we go back. I, I will read the questions in the chat. So take uh, Eva and, and Daniela first. Okay, I'll, I'll take Eva first. Daniela, I'll come to you. Uh, uh, both are very interesting because it's a it's more of a technical question. So the, the way that we, we use it, with the, yes, there is an, a part which is the creation of the taxonomy is done by expert and validated by expert. But again, we deliberately take a first candidate version of that through the concept of regulatory bodies are following international standard setting bodies. And so we take that as a, as a primary source of uh, basic information. Remember that this is a top-down approach. So we start from what is supposed to be as a principle, how the principle has been uh, in, required in the implementation document and the related guidance of the implementation document. So once we construct that, and then we ask regulators to uh, help us validate that, that, that what we put down, it is actually the first two lines uh, of this binomial tree, we train the machine to recognize not word but concepts. And the way we do it is that we provide manually some tagging with the, the process under NLP machine learning called annotation, which is effectively we show the machine a specific document, the document, this is the document, this is the actual area reference in which this, doc, this concept has been described. And you do this sufficient times to the extent that the machine then builds a system for which it recognizes that the concept might be the same, but uh, it is drafted in a different way. The wording is different because what's important here is that the concept is in relation to that. There are other components. Of course, we get into deep learning you know, type of issues. The machine also understands that or select or doesn't select specific text because if, if the concept looks like it's talking about CDD, but it's sitting, so the, the customer due diligence, but it's sitting on, uh, on a document which as a primary document, it is not AML, will not report that to you as this is a piece of information in terms of CDD. So there are these two main components. So it's definitely not just a word search. And it's not even a um, just plain NLP application. NLP basically is the statistical process for which you would have the certain words put in sequence. This is why law and regulation really fits very well the use of AI, because most of the time things are, are, are put in order for a specific reason, uh, using very specific terminology. So NLP applications are very common in the space for that reason. So just to finalize, the short answer is no, it is much more complex than that and is trained to find the obligation, which I think is important. And I was reading your, your, your question, definitely should be used in the academic space because it, it creates a new data set, which we didn't have before. 
Can I just very briefly day. follow up? The, the, the intensity of the green shade, who assigns that? Well, that is a prototype. We, we basically said we're training the machine to recognize if the certain words have been used, right, in a specific format. Again, same concept. Uh, minorly, somebody says this is a very strict one, this is the less strict one, and then it, it produces that meta taxonomy we call it so it's not a taxonomy specifically on the theme it's a meta taxonomy that looks at the language independently of the the concept which has been expressed okay but the process is the same i think professor lastra you're on mute i'm just saying yes it's this this really fascinating mm -hmm. um we have other questions but if you want first to answer to daniel and then maybe we come back to eva after i know that she still is <laughs> she still wants to ask more questions, but uh, uh, definitely you can get in touch with me at any time. We can have a, a, a side discussion for sure. To answer Daniela's question, um, which is more related to basically what's coming next, effectively, if I can summarize very maybe it's too synthetic to be honest, to be to be fair to you, but what's coming next? Um but th this is the process. I think it's very evident that we are going to use machine to digest uh, information. And the way that this is trained, it's, it, it's, it's going to be a process. I gave you the extreme of actually coding law directly into that format. There are very few cases in the world. The first step would be understanding when, you know, what can be done. Right, what, what the current regulations, the world is not going to end one day and start the next day with code in it. So the question there in the intermediary space, in the intermediary space is machine readable format. It would be the first step so that every, all the, the regulation can be digested all in the same format, they have at least understood in the same format. One thing is very important though, if you think about even the code, if you if for for those who are into uh, technology, you probably see Python or you've seen Python language or even plain XML language. Well, let's stick to regulation. If the the the, the only cases of machine executable are all are have been those under Emir type of rules, basically it's the trading component of things, in which the European Union and other regulators, not just the European Union, the Americans do this as well, and others around the world they very much well define every single data point and they call it something. Typically you see various signs, it starts with a sign, it, it is a name, and then you see the tag repeated over and over and over. And that is because you're tagging, you're assigning a specific concept or a specific meaning to one data point, which can be multiple things. What we are trying to do at the university, we are anticipating that machine readable are gonna be used. And so what we are saying is, Hang on a minute, don't start producing your own stuff. Use at least a common standard. We're, we're very happy to, to foot the bill for this. This is the first two layers. So they're similarly to the Dewey Decimal System, we're telling you all the time you have a rule that sounds like AML and it is about KYC and it is CDD. You can use that tag that the university has created. And if you use that, it means that if we use it in the UK and they use it in Europe and they use it elsewhere, it means that the machines were sitting in a different environment. They don't need to be reprogrammed to go and understand that that is the tag. Every single common domain model or common, common, common data model, depending what you're looking at, there are cases. There is uh, is the case. The BIS Innovation Hub has done a variety of projects. Um, they done one for mortgages, right? The project Ellipse, it's actually pretty famous. I spoke to everybody, literally everybody who has done anything about the project. What you will find is that the most hard part, and this is Daniela to support your point, the hardest is actually to come to an agreement between two different countries, how to define the basics. It took six months from project Ellipse. I was told not to say, but I'm gonna say it anyway, to determine in uh, what are the, the 30 data points to describe something as common as a mortgage. If you talk to experts who have done this, they all conclude effectively, either we discuss about common, uh, common data standards or we're not going anywhere, right? Here at Cambridge, we're training a machine to basically recognize the information and do the first step, which is families of obligations. They all sounds like this. You can tag with that, with that specific name convention which you are providing. 
Okay. That's fascinating. Um, the people that have written in the chat, I will read the two questions because they tell me that they don't have a microphone. One is Deborah, how will the taxonomy method deal with the problem of integrating application provisions to give a true reading of the regulations? The UK regulatory regime is like a wedding cake. It has many layers and you have to read through all the layers in order to get the right answer. This includes primary legislation, implementing provisions, exclusions, exemption, secondary legislation, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is what has defeated similar projects in the past. And this is from Wellington, New Zealand. And then the other question, just to finalize this, and then we, we may go back to, to some, some of the other issues. Takashi says, RegTech is, is effective, but I think constructive ambiguity exists in banking regulation. How do you think about it? Well, on the first one, uh, I tend to agree that this is a bit of a, of a mess even between the FCA and PRA. And, and I have to tell you this, we have a committee which we uh, of experts which we use to understand if the, the, what we are producing actually can be used. And we deliberately convinced the head of data and data strategy of the FCA to be the chair of the committee, because we know that the ambiguity comes from the fact that there are different standards. The person was also in the same position in the in the in the PRA before, so it's a strategic decision we took to 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 have Shultana Begum with us. But in order to answer you know your question more directly, uh, yes, the the it is a layer cake. What, what is the it, what is the issue? The issue is that we're not trying to come up to a specific standard for every single rule. We are at least trying to create families of obligations, deliberate. Is the first two levels a tag that says is basically saying the, the two people who are currently in, in this chat talking. This is a Professor Lastra and Dr. Giovanni Bandi. What is the commonality? I can tag both of them with a the tag of academics. Right. That's there's no doubt about that. There are there are, they work for our universities, though everything indicates that that is the case. Does that define what I'm, what is my area of research? Of course not. It's way more further down. Is that academic? Is that uh, law and financial regulation? Is that uh, application at the business level? And that's computer science. It can be of so many different layers. That doesn't take away that the first tag is correct. And so while I understand that, uh, that, I think what happened in New Zealand was that they tried hard to go straight into the lower level. I think you have to go from top to the bottom. Also, those who have conducted analysis for machine executable, they will tell you that they need assistance, uh, the, re the regulators, they will tell you that they need assistance from the bottom, which is always industry, uh, to provide them with what are the missing tags in order to, to proceed with that. So my point is to, to solve it and make it really effective. There's two, two sides of this, is the regulators going from the bottom, to, from the top to the bottom, starting from the most generic ones and then being the industry completing the series to say, yes, this is the obligation is in relation to something that I identify as such. So the work is both hands. The regulators have to do their, their job for sure, but it is also true that industry has to complete it. Otherwise they would always fail. Oh, thank you. And then um, Eva and Deborah, right. Eva, you can ask again the, the risk of hallucination. Yeah, so the, I'm, I'm really asking Deborah's question was, is there a risk of hallucinations here? Actually, the, the, we are, the way we are promoting yes and no, uh, the way we are, I think AIs, generative AIs, they have, halluc they have hallucinations. Chad GPT is convinced that I'm a professor of econometric. I told Chad GPT I'm not a professor of econometric. And he keeps insisting that I'm a professor of econometrics. I don't, I, don't, I, I mean, I know I like econometrics, but I'm definitely not an academic on it. Why is that the case? It's combining my name with some information that is retrieving from somewhere. LLMs, they're not full AIs from that point of view. They are effectively large language models, which are very good at synthesizing information. The way that I look at it is that we are doing the classifiers, which is a bit more traditional than LLMs. The classifiers are actually already embedding the result, already trying to source the information. They're trained to look specifically for some information independently of that being drafted in a way or the other. 
And then the way they're recombining, for, they're not recombining the information itself. So what they think, suspect will happen uh, is that LLMs will be very good at being the synthetic part on top of what classifiers have produced. So even something, the, the Cambridge regular genome, when we process it and we actually have the output results, there's a lot of information. You, you saw that, right? There's a hundred and hundreds of different families of obligation. If you want to read all of them, you're still, it's still very good legwork, right? I mean, you don't have to do it. Regulators love it for comparative analysis. But the, the ultimately, you want a summary of what's written in there. And I think that's where the LLM is going to sit. Having the LLM working with a constricted data, which has already been calibrated, that's the way to reduce hallucination. And, and then they were further asked, who carries the legal risk of hallucination? Oh, well, that's uh, whoever is, is willing to, to use that information, if you ask me. Um, we, I mean, the, again, the, this, what we're promoting at the university, the, their genome is, is just a schema to extra the information correctly and tag it correctly. It's, yeah. not, a, it's not a question, a way of uh, uh, integrating that into yeah. uh, a final answer. I have, uh, in my privilege as chair, I have a couple of final questions. One is towards the end, but this, when you talk about the future, you talk about embedded supervision. And that's a concept which I find really interesting and in which I have been talking to people at the BIS and at the Innovation Hub. And I would like you to say a few more things about embedded supervision. And then finally, everyone is talking these days and you just said that ChatGPT thought that you were a professor of econometrics. Um, we had a conversation ourselves about chat, chat GPT. I remain very concerned for many reasons. I see the opportunities, but I also remain very concerned. We all now have our examples of, you know, getting things into chat GPT and seeing what it produces just to get an idea. And it's quite mesmerizing. So just a couple of quick reflections, one on embedded supervision, which I'm interested in academically and the other chat GPT which I'm interested for a variety of reasons that we discussed already. Yeah, well, embedded supervision, it really depends on the technology which is used. I was a supervisor myself. Uh, that's when, when we met, right? I was working as director of supervision. And one of my problems was always, okay, we, we have information, but we, we need to read it. We need to process it. How will we know straight away if a, a firm is compliant or not? The level of compliance is actually not very different than basically executing something is something true or not there have been a couple of cases uh, of, of trying to do that uh, actually my own country banca d'italia banca d'italia uh, did a, a pilot project uh, they tried to basically convert an entire rulebook into a format which was yes or no yes or no and and uh, and then provided that to the supervisor with, with with that type of analysis that firms three pilot firms would have, would assign yes or no yes or no the supervisor thought that it was not sufficient. And this is because I think that that is not what embedded supervision really is. Embedded supervision can occur when something is very well prescribed. The best case scenario is the case of the, the I mentioned earlier, the European Union attempt to install something in, um, using uh, basically smart contracts. So here is derivatives trading and derivatives trading they have very specific uh, requirements. Uh, you need to provide information about it. They were born like that 10 years ago. It was really there. Actually, the UK implemented even before the European Union did. And we had the type of information already in a specific format. If you want to know if you are complying with what you're supposed to, if you convert that into through various language of uh, um, what, what, what a smart contract would do effectively uh, providing information on something automatically means that that is the, that you, you have complied with it then it, it's kind of populating information you are complying with it the automation process so when i talk about the embedded super supervision that's what we're talking about the other very simple one is the one i was telling earlier the, the fact that there's uh, uh, crypto assets where well, crypto assets actually if you have access to the dlp they are there are nothing by you know crypto meant as you know something uh, that you don't know about. Uh, is, there's nothing cryptic about it. It's not just the code to create it. If you have access to the DLT, you can actually have all the information that you want. In fact, here in the UK, we have um, 
a case, I think in the Cardiff uh, University, uh, they, they have recently launched a new database that basically reads inside Bitcoins because they, everything is embedded inside the Bitcoin in the chain and they're able to say, this is the amount, this is the transaction went between this party and that party and, and, and the so far and so on. So it is inevitable with the adoption of technologies to actually have that automated fashion of understanding and get, gaining information. Because the regulator ultimately that's what they want and what they're supervising, they can get instant information for them is way, way more appealing than uh, receiving reports uh, every three months, every month or every six months, depending on what you're doing. Uh, having live information, but the live information can only be captured if the underlying transaction is, uh, is already built in a technology platform that allows for that information. And the more we move toward certain type of technologies, DLT, smart contracts, all of that, the easier it will be to catch live that. Yeah. Rafael Aweli, the BIS, has produced a number of papers on embedded supervision, which are quite interesting. So, yeah. Anyway, and on final reflection on chat, chat GPT. Well, uh, and this is the discussion we had with, with the same day we, we were talking in the morning, Chat, chat GPT 4.0 was released. And the, the, if you go and observe the, the various version 3.5, uh, was basically failing the LSAT, and uh, which in the United States is uh, it is necessary to go to law school or the, even the bar exam. Uh, and, and apparently, 4.0 managed to, to get a confidence level of 89 or, or more. It is actually very interesting concept. Is that is ChatGPT going to be useful? I think so. Uh, I, again, for me, it's LLM models. But no matter how you want to do it, in order to, for them to function well, they will have to be fine-tuned, meaning the hallucination that uh, uh, Eva was talking about earlier. It's, there are methodologies to, 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 to do that. So from a technical point of view, they're, they're very useful if you know how to use them. Can they substitute a human mind uh, to do the work or even find new, new aspects of it? I think that they, they 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 can do more of the same type of thinking, more faster and, and, and populate more information, but that does not mean they are still able to follow a path of uh, uh, of intelligence, not at all. I've, actually, they're not designed for that. They're designed just for rewriting and summarizing. It's just that they do it on a much more set of information that we are able to digest ourselves. Thank you very much. This was really fascinating and we could continue, not just for one, several hours. Eva has put in the chat another paper of hers on RecTech, which you know is also interesting, very interesting reading. I mean, I, I was last year in a panel together with Lawrence Lessig of Harvard. And of course, his idea of lowest code has found a new dimension in all the discussions that we're having at the moment on artificial intelligence. So thanks very much for this. I think it's a seminal project, Joan, Giovanni, and that's why I invited you to, to be part of our seminar today. Really, thank you so much. I have more questions than answers, but that's always good. That shows that this is really fascinating and a lot of the future. So together with all of us, experts, students, alumni, regulators, and uh, academics, uh, thank you very much, Giovanni. And we, we, we will continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.